We are church. We are redeemed and chosen, trusting in the God of love, the God of hope, the God of atonement. We are church. We believe in one way, one truth, one life. Devoted, eyes fixed on the prize, devoted to Christ. We are church. We put God first. We are like-minded people created in Christ for good works. Made in the image of greatness, made to reflect the greatest love ever known. We are church, the light in the dark, the hope to the hopeless, a brand new start. Peace for the broken heart, a love that has open arms. We are church, not four walls. We are a body of believers following the call, the call to know we are forgiven, the call to love without condition, the call to trust without division. We are church, a community with open doors, serving the poor, living for more. We are broken people with a united cause, an unbroken love and a divided society proclaiming Jesus is Lord. This is what we do, we don't judge, we don't hold a grudge, we are not perfect but we aspire to love, we are church. Good morning everybody, let's stand together, hoping you are ready to worship Jesus this morning. Who's ready to worship Jesus? Let's sing our praise. Our praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded. I praise cause the water, my enemies drowned in. Sing as long, as long.
just welcome your presence as always, Lord. We welcome your presence in this place, Jesus. And we just want to worship you. We want our hearts to overflow, God, with worship to you this morning. And we give you all the praise, Jesus. Let's sing, I won't forget. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you found me, you freed me, held back the waters from my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights. so much Jesus we praise your name God we praise you Jesus thank you Lord the Bible says trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding this next song we're gonna sing as I was preparing this week I was reminded 
For those of you who have kids or have little kids, maybe your kids have done this to you. You know, you might be standing somewhere and your kid might come up and lean against you. And they, you've, if, you've, if you've had little kids, they lean and they almost put their whole body weight against you. And they lean and they lean to the point where if you moved, they'd probably fall on the ground, right? But it's such an amazing picture of us leaning on Christ, leaning on God. And we can lean on Him. We can trust in Him because He's faithful. Amen? So as we sing this next song, we can, we can just believe that God is so faithful and so trustworthy that we can lean. We can, we can lean our total, everything that we are of our, ourselves. We can lean on Him because He's worthy and He's faithful. So let's sing this next song together. And what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. And what a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Sing this with me. I'm Thank 
you, Jesus. Thank you for your faithfulness. Yeah, let's just lift up our thanks to him this morning. Jesus, Jesus, we thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, you are worthy, Jesus. So worthy, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, God. Lord, we want you to be such a part of our lives. We want everything, God. We want you to be a part of every part of our lives. Jesus, thank you, Lord. So, God, we make room for you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Here is where I lay it down. Every bird on every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender.
give him a shout of praise. Jesus, we lift you high. We give you praise this morning. We give you praise. God, would you shake up our ground that we may be walking on this morning? Lord, I don't know what each and every one of us have walked through this morning even just to get here, but Lord, you do. You know what we've been walking through this week. You know the struggles and the challenges. You know our, our lack of faith in certain areas of our life where we compartmentalize. You can have this one, Jesus, but I'm gonna take these ones. Lord, we repent. We're sorry. Help us. Help us to submit our whole lives before a good God. Help us, we need you. We surrender our traditions and we surrender our ideas, we surrender our, our thoughts before you. Reform us, change us, help us. You know, church, this morning I was driving and uh, to get here and I looked off to, to my left and I saw these two people, they were walking together. And, and, and they were getting, I was getting closer and closer to them. And as I, I went, I drove right beside them, I looked and they were actually 20 feet apart. Perspective is a funny thing, isn't it? So you may be here going, oh, my relationship is great with Jesus. I'm doing wonderful. But you take a different perspective and you go, oh, how far have I come? How far am I from my relationship with Jesus? Enough is enough. He invites you into relationship. You don't have to stand far off. And so this morning, Jesus, all across this room, we turn our hearts and our minds to you. Close the gap. Close the gap. Lord, would you show us what it's like to walk in step with the creator of the world, the savior of my soul. Lord, close the gap. Help us this morning. Flood us with joy overflowing because when the Holy Spirit resides, there's fruit. And part of that fruit is joy for goodness sakes. Lord, I pray that we would be a light because when we walk in step with you, it changes everything. Help us, we pray. Come on, everybody said amen. Come on, everybody said amen. amen. When you speak about Chennai, it's a massive city. Uh, and, and Jesus said, just lift up your eyes, the fields are white for harvest. That's exactly what I think of this place. And God has given India so many people that are waiting to be reached. We knew that God was calling us to serve him full time in ministry uh, and to plant a church here. So we moved to a southern city called Chennai. And this is where everything started. Right in the living room of my parents' apartment, slowly, people start to come. God gave us three, five, and 15 people in this very living room. And once this was full, we moved to the rooftop, put a shelter, and we continued to pastor the people God gave us. He gave us 50 people on the rooftop room. From there, we were able to install a thin metal shelter where the church grew to 100 plus people. God gave us a faith to trust Him to hire a rental facility right in the heart of the city of Chennai. But it came with a $6,000 rent every single month. In the meantime, the church grew in that rental facility. We learned a lot. We faced challenges every month paying that $6,000 rent and other bills. But God helped us through that place. We knew as the church was outgrowing the place that our season there was coming to an end. As we prayed, 
we believed and we understood that we need our own facility in order to fulfill every dream and vision the Lord has given us for this nation. It was at that moment the Lord opened us a door and he helped us purchase this very apartment from my parents and also two more apartments that is very close to this one. It was our responsibility to raise a facility. We shared the vision to the local people that attended the church. We all came together and the people of this church came alongside. They sold everything precious that they had, their jewels and other things. Many people who could not give huge sum of money decided to come and give their hands to the work of God. My friends, look what the Lord has done. We have four different floors renovated in this place where there was a three old apartments. Every sacrifice, every tears, prayer, fasting, sweat and blood was totally worth it. This nation is 1.4 billion people and this one church wasn't enough. The entire journey that we had till now was only because God was equipping us to plant a church, to pastor and to teach us how to multiply churches. So now we know without a doubt the call of God in our life is not only to pastor this church but to multiply the work of God through the planting of churches across this nation. From the moment that we started this work in Chennai, India, it's also been your story uh, through your prayers, through your care, and of course through your generous financial giving to a people you've never met and perhaps a couple that you've never known. So together we just want to thank you from the bottom of our heart for what you have done in Chennai uh, for every child for every family, for every person that has come here and seen their lives change, we want to thank you for what you've done and for everything that you have supported us with. Well, come on, would you get up on your feet and let's welcome Pastor Crystal and Sarah Emmanuel. They've come all the way from Chennai, India, to preach this morning. Come on. And I just wanna say uh, before I, I'm a pastor, I'm just gonna keep talking, just like you. Listen, um, I've seen the journey that you guys have been on over the last 10 plus years, and I can attest that God has been moving powerfully through both of you. And so we stand with you, we love you, and the pulpit is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much, Pastor Mike. Those are dangerous words, you have to know, you have to know. So I just want to say a great, big, huge hi and hello. Uh, my name is Sarah, my husband is Christo. Now, he's never been to Kelowna, so last night as we flew in on a little prop plane shaking in the wind, that was his first experience. Uh, but I grew up with family here, my wonderful auntie. Uh, she's from Lake Country, so I grew up with, thank you auntie. <laughs> I grew up with just amazing memories of going to Lake Kalamalka, and I was a little girl, and I used to dive in that water, grab my snorkel set, and just be swimming around. My parents were always freaked out. Like, my mom would always lie, Sarah, there's a big jackfish in that lake, and it's going to eat you if you go there. So I was always freaking my parents out, but little did I know I would freak them out again 17 years ago when I decided to get married and move to India. Uh, and it's, it is, has been an adventure ever since. You know, God is an exciting God. We serve a God that is so exciting. He's not boring. And if you decide, as the song we sang today, 
I'm going to make room for you, Lord. Then your life will be full of adventure. It's not easy. It is absolutely not easy, but you'll never, ever regret it if you make room for him today. So I am just supposed to be here not to babble on, but to introduce our family. Uh, We have three wonderful daughters. I don't know if we have that family picture up there on the slide. Yeah, there we go. So the little one in the middle, that's our youngest, Rayma. She's 10. Uh, Simona's 13, and Evangeline just turned 16 here in Canada. Uh, And we asked her, Eva, what do you want for your birthday? And, you know, she tried to pass the thing, well, I want a phone, but, you know, you know, we were a little bit strict on that one. So we said, okay, what, what do you want other than a phone? And she said, I want to go bungee jumping. So Christo took her bungee jumping. Uh, it was wild. We had some amazing memories. And we're alive. Yeah, we had lots of prayers on that day. But all this being said, just as a family, we're so thankful to be here in Kelowna, in Evangel, and thank you, Pastor Mike and Pastor Christina, for bringing us here, for opening your arms and welcoming us as part of your family. I hope that you're really moved by what God is doing across the world, because it's exciting, it's living, it's active, and I believe that... Not only will you see how other lives are being touched, yours will be as well. So I hand it off to you now, dear husband, and have fun. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Mike and Christina, for uh, bringing us here to Kelowna. I have heard so much about this place from Sarah and from our childhood memories, but this is my first time here. But I'm so sorry, I cannot appreciate Kelowna now. Because we came in last night and only saw Kelowna in the dark. So I have to come back again. But I've heard about the the beauty and the glory of this amazing city. Uh, So I want to thank the Lord for that. I also want to bring greetings from the four different campus that me and Sarah oversee called Living God Church. You see in India, people believe that there is 333 million gods and goddesses. And people are very willing to add Jesus to the list. That's why we called the congregation, we pastor Living God Church, because when you come into the house, you experience something different that millions could not offer you. And it's working well. Also, I came to know that there is a group of Spanish-speaking people here Korean-speaking people and Portuguese uh, sitting, and you're receiving uh, the words that I speak in English translated to you. So kindly excuse me, because I did not give my notes to the people that are translating right now. Some places they ask me, do you have a PowerPoint? I say, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I do have some points with power. (laughs) So... Kindly excuse if I'm going fast and if they are unable to catch up with me translate, translating what I'm saying, and I want you to give us some grace today, okay? The topic that I want to share with you today is called Kingdom Stewardship. So let's look into this passage in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 11 onwards. There is one very familiar scripture in this chapter that many of you have heard several times. That's verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came to give you life. But here, my focus is from verse 11 onwards. Kindly listen as I read it. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he is who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, and he flees. The wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is just a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Jesus said again, I am the good shepherd. I know the sheep. And I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so, I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Just imagine Jesus standing in Israel 
among the Jewish people, among the religious people and saying this, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. He was thinking about you and me. He was thinking about me be building a missional church. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. That's the vision of Jesus. But let me break down this passage to you. It starts by saying, I am the good shepherd. You see, the good shepherd came to give life. A good shepherd is someone who guides the flock, who cares, who nourishes, who protects. And Jesus did this for each and every human being. But he's here saying, he's inviting you to receive Jesus as your good shepherd. Maybe this morning you have come to church, somebody invited you, or you've been coming regularly to this church. But just coming to church does not make Jesus your good shepherd. He's saying, have you verbally made a commitment to receive Jesus as your good shepherd? You see, my speech today is about being a steward in God's kingdom. And you can never, ever, ever be a steward without receiving Jesus, encountering Jesus as your good shepherd. The word encounter. You see, even though we know English, we come from a culture where we don't speak English. We have to go to a special school to learn English. And I myself, I did not study English properly. I only learned as I lived in Canada for a few years and as I married Sarah and had Tons of arguments in English. That's how you learn and that's how you learn language. You can put your hands together for our cross-cultural marriage. <laughs> but you see this, the word encounter. As I say to you that each and every one of us have to encounter this good shepherd. If I would say that word encounter in my city, it has a very different meaning. If I go to someone and say, hey, there was an encounter in the city this morning. And two of them encounter one another. It means they shot one another. It means there was a gang fight. And cops were shooting the gangsters. But I know, you know what it means to the meaning of the word encounter. I had a Jesus encounter. You see, I was born and brought up in a city of about 10 and more million. 10 plus million people. If you gather the outskirts, it can even reach up to 12 million people and there was times of revival in my city also 2000 years before Thomas the apostle came and gave gospel and there was ups and downs after that in the movement of Christianity but there was times of revival and often there would be revival services in the seashore we come from a city called Chennai which is a coastal city in the southern part of India and people kept inviting me to this meeting. I was born and brought up in a, a Catholic home. You see, Indian Catholicism is very different than Catholicism in your part of the world. It is synchronized with the local Hindu religion. So the practices that any uh, local religious people would do is also adopted to Catholicism. So we lived a life of rituals, practicing all other things and, and burning incense and just going to church once in a while and confessing our sins to, to the priest once in a while. This was our practice. We did not even open the Bible. We have a great respect for the Bible. You know what we do? I remember this. When my dad got his first salary, he would bring in that salary, he put it right in between the Bible and he would close the Bible. That's how much they love the Bible. And immediately after a few seconds, he would remove it. Now it's anointed money. That's going to last us forever. So he would take the Bible. My mom would put way up top so nobody can reach it until the next salary day. And we would burn candles and incense. That's how we practiced. But you see, when I was not in Christ, I was like a child who always could not catch up to the pressures 
of my Indian uh, family members. In India, you always have to be top in the classroom. They always teach you. If somebody asks you, what's your dream? You say, I want to be a doctor. If you fail to be a doctor, the next option is engineer. If you fail to be an engineer, you have to settle down to be an accountant somewhere. <laughs> that's, that's the option that was given to us. But you see, I could not match any of those three things. I had four and five and other things that my culture didn't agree about. I wasn't good in performing school. But I was this kid, you can imagine, that would always do anything for anyone to make them laugh. I want that attention. I would do anything to belong in a community, to belong with a group of friends. This once, uh, what I did was, I wanted to earn favor from my friends, so I, I, I gave a good gift to my teacher. I found a huge frog in my backyard that my mom told me, go and get rid of this frog, and I obeyed. But it came back the very next day. I don't know how, so I packed it, I took it to my school, I really wrapped it and I gave it to my teacher. And I was sitting right in the classroom watching what's going to happen. As she unwrapped and rolled and rolled and the frog leaped up and then fell on her table. She screamed. You know what? She screamed, Crystal! She screamed my name. She exactly knew who caused trouble in the class. See, I was that kind of kid. I would do anything and slowly my life started to become a mess. Hang around with the wrong kind of guys. Start smoking and drinking. My dad was working in a police department. He said to me, I'm afraid that you will end up in a prison one day that I am managing. You know? So, it was like that. You see, my dad is an amazing guy. He is a man of integrity. But I never ever received the love I expected from my dad. My dad had a different kind of love language. He would always spend money on buying me things and bringing goodies back home. But I don't remember a time that I actually spent playing with my dad. I don't remember a time that I actually was carried and taken out for a vacation on things like that. But he was taking care of our family. You see, this thing causes deep wound. Many times, whatever you are going through in your life right now is not because of the decision you made just yesterday or last year. It even happened when you were a child and you went through things. It scores you for the rest of your life. I carried so many things like that. I craved attention. I didn't feel like I was loud. I was capable. I felt like I was good for nothing. And so before everyone, I would always have a happy, joyful face. But in my private time, I would weep. I would cry. I'm, I would say to myself, I'm no good for anything. Over and above, somebody in India would buy me something. Let's say it's a watch. I wore the watch and the next day it's not working. My uncle, just for funny reasons, they would say, well, whatever you touch is not working, man. But I should have told them, well, you got me made in China stuff. That's why it's not working. Well, see, I am Indian. I can get away with anything I say today. <laughs> Pastor Mike does not have that freedom. He would be fired, but you can't fire me. Okay? So... So you see, I, these are all things that people say for, for funny reasons. Indian culture is like that. People say things that they don't even mean. We just use words like that. And, and it would stay in our heart. This was my childhood. I was living a life of mess. But guess what? Right after my grade 12, I was invited to go to a revival meeting that was happening in our city, in the seashore. Why on earth? I would go for that. The only reason is, it's happening on a seashore. Maybe we can check some things out. So I went there, sitting there, not interested about hearing the gospel. But as I sat in that seashore, guess what? As they worship Jesus, like the worship team right now, that make room song was amazing. Let's, let's give it up for that worship team, for that amazing song. As I listened to the songs, I started to cry, my friends. I started to weep. I didn't even know why. I want to look cool as a young chap. 
I don't want to cry and embarrass myself before all the beautiful Indian ladies that was attending around me. But I didn't know what, why I started to cry. And as I cried and kept crying, when the preaching happened, it was not a, a simple, easy, sugar-coated preaching. It was about sin. It was about the consequences of sin. It was about how my lifestyle and every other lifestyle before receiving Jesus is hurting the heart of God. And as I listened to that message that convicted me of my sin, it's okay to feel that conviction. It's okay if a preaching moves us to a place of repentance. It's not a message about that we say and criticize, oh, they are trying to guilt trip us. No, it was the, the Holy Spirit was there and he moved me to repentance and look at me, my life was changed from that preaching. And on that day, the preacher said, if you want to give your life to Jesus, anyone there, come towards the altar. I don't even know what altar call was. I was in the beach, in the seashore. I ran towards the altar. And dozens and dozens and dozens of people ran along with me to the altar. And there I stood and I cried. At that point, the preacher said this salvation prayer. He said, pray this prayer after me. Jesus, come into my heart. I said, Jesus, don't come into my heart. You see rebellion? Even in the salvation prayer, it comes out of me. I said, Jesus, this thing that you are expecting from me, this, this stuff in the Bible, I cannot do that. I cannot live that way. I, I don't have that capacity. I have always had filthy language coming out of my mouth. I smoke, I drink, I hang around with the wrong people. I watch filthy things. The, the, my mind is corrupt. I just cannot quit all of these things and, and come. But on that day, I heard Jesus said, give your life to me. And you know what I heard from Jesus? Like, like it said here, like Jesus said here in verse 16, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they will hear my voice. This is a word for you, evangel. There is somebody here or even this week in the church and you're struggling. I'm not hearing anything. I don't know which way to go, what to do. I am confused. It looks like this is God's voice, but I have a doubt. I just, I'm just all alone. And this morning as I prayed, I felt this is a word that the Lord is giving you that the Lord is saying, I will go out there to the other sheep and they will hear my voice. And I didn't hear his voice. He said this, I have plans for you. I have purpose for you, plans of good and hope, not of evil. I just heard that still small voice. You know, my daughter, she would come and she came and asked me several years before, how, Dada, how do we know that Jesus really speaks? Everyone is saying Jesus speaks. I know the answer, but you know, to break down to a toddler or somebody very young, I took a pause and then, and then I said to her, you know what, if Jesus speaks, that person who listened his voice, his life will reflect the transformation of the voice he heard. If there is no change, it means he just had too much spaghetti and meatballs the day before. You see what I mean? Jesus spoke to me. And it was a seven-day revival service. Every day I went to that service, I gave my life to Jesus on that altar. And on the seventh day, I was looking for a church. I didn't know. Nobody invited me. I was walking on the highway for about five kilometers asking where can I go and find a church. I walked and I heard some people worshiping. That's why it's important to worship out loud. Because somebody is passing by and they are waiting for a voice. And Jesus right now is going to use his church to, to send his voice to the people that are walking on that highway. You see, we cannot come to church and always think, okay, I'm just going to be comfortable. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to sing. I'm because somebody is there and Jesus wants to use us. We are his hands and we his feet and his body right now. There, there is a reason that Jesus called us his body. How many of you know body has hands and feet? Good. Even in this part of the world, that's nice to know. Probably a bigger hand and a bigger feet than Indian sizes. 
But you see, I, I walked there. I went to the church and they said, open your Bibles to Jeremiah 29, 11. I looked at people and they were searching. I guess they were also new to the church. They were searching everywhere. And finally, they found Jeremiah 29, 11. And it said this, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans of hope and future, not of evil. You will seek me and you will find me. And it goes on. And I felt like, like this is something I, I have already heard before. And I then recognized this was the still small voice of that good shepherd who said, I have more sheep that is not of this fold out there that I need to go and speak to them. When I speak, they will know my voice and they will come back into the fold. I came back into the fold called Church of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Since then, my friends, I became steward of this message I received from God. Now, if somebody would come and ask me this question, why do you do this ministry? Why, do, why are you a, a, a minister of the gospel, a, a pastor of an assembly, a congregation in India? Why do you do this? You know, I have so many reasons I could pull out. I say, I have a burden for the lost people. I could say, I love my people. I want God's kingdom to be established. I could say all those things. But can I be honest with you? Something that really comes out of me is this. I want to be a steward of that message Jesus entrusted to me when I met him in the year 2002, Feb 10th, on the seashore of the coastal city of India. I want to be a steward of that. That's why I'm saying, uh, Jesus is say, looking at the religious leader, the Jewish people, everyone who know Bible and everything, and he said, I am the good shepherd. If you do not encounter this good shepherd, you cannot be a kingdom steward in the country or in the world that God has placed you. And do you get what I mean? Can I get an amen? Okay, so when you go to an Indian restaurant, you see what people do? They look at you and they ask you this. You want it mild, medium, or extremely hot? Because you cannot handle spice. Right? But you got an Indian chef for today. So I want to ask you, you want it mild, medium, or extremely hot? Ah, no, I'm going to keep it medium because I want you to invite me back again. I'm going, uh, yeah. You see, I want to ask you this question. Have you received the message? Have you encountered this Jesus as your good shepherd? Do you feel his guidance every day? Do you feel him nourishing your soul, giving care? Do you allow him to care for your soul every day? Do you feel him protecting you, leading you? Do you feel that about the good shepherd? No matter where you go on your Monday till, till Saturday, you, do you feel him coming alongside God is asking you, I want you, church, evangel, I'm the global church. I want you to be steward of the message entrusted to you. You know, God does not need you and me. But for some unknown reason, God is asking us to take this message of the gospel to the end of the earth. But how can you take the message as pastors and leaders and as people, stewards that we feel we have to establish God's kingdom here with his help, of course. We feel like, folks, help us. Do something about it. Let's all do together. And maybe we get emotional and intense in our preaching because of the passion we want to, uh, passion we have for God's kingdom to be established in many parts of the world. You maybe feel like, why are these guys getting so intense? Why bother? They're getting paid. Let them do this job. But our, uh, God is here asking you, I have given you the message. Are you a steward of that? Are you a steward of the message that you received about the cross of Calvary? You know what I've seen? I know we think mission is about um, feeding the hungry and giving water to people, uh, clothing the naked and all those things, uh, helping the poor. But you know what I have seen? These things are good. God has commanded us to love one another and we ought to do them. But one thing I have seen in the field is this sort of help does not really bring transformation. But the message of gospel truly transforms culture. You give an apple a day to someone, in the end they go to hell. What sort of mission we have accomplished as a church? God is asking you, are you a steward 
of the message you have received. Even today, I feel like if I go back home, you know, if I go back elsewhere, I'll feel like, Lord, have I been a steward of that message I heard so many years before about how you loved us, how you gave yourself on the cross, every drop of your blood shed for the humanity. This is the only way for you to reconcile man to God and to get, give us eternal life. I received it from you. You, you know what? Bible said, Jesus said this, I, you did not choose me, I chose you. If some of you are sitting here, you're thinking, you I made it to church, I, 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 I made a decision to be baptized, I have received Jesus, we've been Christian for generations. I'm sorry to say, you did not choose Jesus, Jesus chose you. Why? He says further, in Gospel of John chapter 15, he said, so that you might go Go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, you shall receive it. Do you get it, my friends? If you don't have a real encounter with this Jesus as your good shepherd, as your personal Lord and Savior, there's no way, no matter how much we preach, you will not engage in the global mission. You will not engage in reaching your neighbor for Jesus because you simply did not experience this awesome, great love of Jesus. Then he further, he goes and says this, but a hireling, a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, he does not own the sheep, he does not care about the sheep, and if the, if the wolf come, he would flee. You see, then he points to the people called hireling. Before I go into that, I want to say there's three kinds of people in the global church. In the global church, India, Africa, Canada, anywhere you go. The first kind, I call them the people that have stuck into the trap of this hireling mindset. In a moment, I will explain to you what that is. Hireling mindset. The second group of people that, that are just doing so well in God's kingdom, but I am the center of it all. Everything God has to do is for me. I need a miracle. I need a financial breakthrough. I need a blessing. But they are so good at coming to church, doing all the Christian things right, but for the wrong reason. The third kind of people are the actual people I call as the kingdom stewards where they are doing the mission method with the right motives. You see these three things have to align. Your mission and your motive and the method you use to accomplish that mission God gave you. And those are the uh, kingdom steward I call them. Are you with me? You see you need to know something about India. How many of you like Indian food? I'm still keeping it mild. Do you believe that? <laughs> Some of you are thinking, I have no idea what a spice means. If this is mild, you would not bear the spice. But you see, in India, everything has to be noisy. That's just my culture. If there's no noise, we feel like something has really gone missing. So I need some noise, okay? Oh, yeah, that's good. Thank you. But you know what? I, they told me, Canadians are kind. They are super good. You know, they will ask sorry if somebody else steps on their feet. That's how kind they are. Okay, now I don't even have time for more jokes now. Jesus, forgive me. The thing is here, uh, God is, uh, there's three kinds of people in the church. I call them the hireling mindset. And the people who feels I am the boss, I am the center of it all. And then the third kind, we call them the kingdom steward. I may not have time to cover all these things, but one thing I want to focus is the, is the hireling mentality of the church believers at this time and generation. What does that mean? Jesus broke it down and he said this. He said, the hireling people are not the true shepherd. Oh, you're thinking now, hey, this is a message for Pastor Christo or Pastor Mike or Pastor Christina or Sarah or, or you guys who are in the ministry. No, you know you are called to be priest. You are called. That's why, that's why Peter said in, in the book of Peter, chapter, one, uh, chapter 2, verse 9, 1 Peter, he said, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. And he said this, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, Jesus is the high priest, but you are the royal priest. 
You can never say, oh, I'm not the shepherd. You know, that's not my job. That's not what Jesus called you into the church for. He's saying here to the people, there's three problems with the people. The hireling mindset. What is that hireling mindset? I don't know whether you have a, a I, the one thing I appreciate in the Canadian culture is you guys do all your work. Like, I like that one, you know. Once I went to McDonald's very recently and I saw everything was machined. You go, you put your food, and then you go do that, and finally uh, you cause a mess in the table and you clean that up. Am I right? <laughs> and I was sitting with the Canadian, I said, don't clean the table up. He said, no, we ought to be so responsible. We ought to be steward, you know, and he went on a kingdom stewardship preaching. No, I'm just kidding. So he's talking about all the stewardship, everything, and then he cleaned. I said, you just took someone's job away. If you keep 10 tables not cleaned up, you just gave a job to at least two individuals in your country. Now, don't follow this. <laughs> oh, don't follow this. Okay? Uh, it's just the way that our mind works uh, when we come from the eastern uh, part of, uh, of the world. But you see, uh, coming back, here he said, what is this hireling mindset trap that the church is getting stuck into? Number one, he said that. Those people are the ones that say, I don't own the sheep. I don't own the work of God. That's not my business. That's somebody else's business. And then they would say, uh, we don't care. You know, we are doing well. We, we receive the gospel. We go to church. Uh, we, oh, there's so much presence today in worship. There was so much presence. The problem with the church is they always go after the presence but forget that the presence of God is there in existence in the church in your, in your life for the purpose of God to be accomplished through you. Are you with me? Now I know I have to finish my message soon. They asked me, where are you going to land your message? I said, I just plan to climb up. I don't know. I will just finish when it's time to finish. But, but listen to this. Um, Listen to this. Uh, let me give you this one. Acts chapter. I'm just jumping out from my notes, okay? You need to know, before I got saved, I had a problem that I didn't even know that I had. When I came to Canada, somebody looked at me and said, hey, you have ADHD. <laughs> they didn't ask me. In that, they weren't kind. They didn't ask me, do you have ADHD? They just said, you have ADHD. I said, thank you, sir. I didn't know. I thought it was another term to call someone handsome. So I went back, came, you know, I did all my research about the ADHD. And, and I came back to that person. I asked him, what is ADHD? And they said this, attention, deficit, hyperactive disorder. I'm sure you figured that out as I'm preaching. But they said this, and I said, that sounds bad. That sounds bad. I'm not even sure whether I have that. You see, I appreciate all the, all the technology and all the diagnosis that doctors do here. But you see, don't put labels on people. People who don't even have ADHD after you diagnose them will get a severe one. <laughs> but instead, if people really do have ADHD and you don't put that label on them, they will probably recover and be someone like me <laughs> doing ADHD in church. You know what? I went back to that person after a few days. I looked at that person and I said this. You know what? I do have ADHD. I said this, but in my dictionary, it is additional drive for humongous destiny in Jesus' name. Yeah. But you see, uh, let me come back to the presence in the church, you always want, you want presence and you want power. People switch church. They go from one place to the other looking for a better church where, where I feel like, oh, I feel more presence here. I feel more power here. You know, book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you know what it said? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power and go to a place where you want more power. And go to a, another season where you want to experience more and more power. No. And you shall be a witness to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. And you know what? Jesus said, I gave the church presence of God. 
I gave the church power of the Holy Spirit. The presence is there. The power is there. And God is saying, church, will you go and be my witness? Guess what? Church said, we will just, you know how they ask everything. Everyone sold everything. They laid it at the feet of Pastor Apostle Mike. And then and they just uh, stayed in Kelowna. And I can imagine men flipping burgers and, and kids just running around all praise and worship. And they are waiting for Jesus to come. Didn't happen. Jesus said, I gave you the presence of God. I gave you the power of the Holy Spirit so that you would go and fulfill the kingdom purpose. That's being steward of the power and the presence God is giving you. Are you with me, church? Can I get an amen? But, but, but you see, but you see, the thing is, did the church go? It didn't go. Like you flip the burgers. Let's flip Acts chapter 1, 8 as 8, 1. You know what happened? Acts 1, 8 said, you will receive power and you will go and be my witness. But you know what Acts 8, 1 said? There was great persecution in the church. And men scattered everywhere. And people who scattered everywhere went about preaching the gospel because Jesus did not like. He loved his church, but he did not the, like the way the church is functioning. Staying in one place, uh, you know, having this power and presence for themselves, having this is all for me kind of mindset. I am the center of it all. I want God's blessing more and more. And with that mindset, Pastor Mike, what time do you finish your service? That's a wrong thing to say to an Indian, you know, we, have, we call it the IST. Have you heard of the term IST? That's the term we use for the time in India. And it's Indian stretchable time. <laughs> I know you folks love hockey game. And you would stay in the arena till that last final moment. So I'm going to finish it up. You know, I'm just going to finish it. But I want to say you this. If you don't allow the presence and the power to move you to the purpose, God will have to send you persecution to move you to the purpose. There will come a day, Canada. I will come back and I'll say to you, welcome to the club called persecution. Because right now as I'm speaking to you, about 300 churches was burnt in India in the last couple months. Persecution is everywhere. And it's okay for the church to be persecuted. You know why? When persecution comes, you need to know God is then with the waiting uh, on people to fulfill kingdom purpose. And he's forcefully moving you to a place where you will have no other way than fulfilling God's purpose for you and his kingdom. So today I want you to take that kingdom stewardship. Be a steward of the gospel. Be a steward of the power. Be a steward of the presence of God that God has released into your life. You know, I want to show you a picture of, of a boy called Bharat. Bharat was born with blindness. Pastor Mike, I am here serving God and serving you. Anytime you say this, I am dead. Okay? <laughs> Bharat. Bharat was born with blindness. 12 year old. He was moving from grade 6 to grade 7. And he was often invited to the kids ministry we have. We started our ministry 2007 in India as a kids ministry. Sarah sat under a tarp. You would see that picture as well there. Uh, in the next slide, Sarah sat under a tarp, started humble kids ministry. Our first kids camp were only a handful of kids standing on the steps as you see there. That was our kids ministry. But it grew year by year. And one time we invited Bharat. We sent a bus. We picked him up. He was born with blindness. He came to the church and he stayed for the entire one week kids camp. On the last day of the camp he recited all the scripture without a flaw. We were amazed. We dropped Bharat back his home and we were waiting for him to come back to church next week and we heard this news. Bharat died. And we were shocked. We are like, what's happening? Why is this happening? And we wanted an investigation to happen and then when that happened, we came to know as a church 
This is not a news that happened anywhere in India. It happened in our house, in our church. And we came to know that Bharat's death was not natural. Somebody killed him. And there was further investigation. And guess what? You need to know Bharat's background a little bit. When Bharat was born, his dad left him because he didn't want to deal with his blindness. It was too hard for him. He, he rejected his wife and his son and he left with another woman. His mom was struggling with life as well. And now when the investigation happened, we found out it was nobody else than Bharat's own mother who killed him. She suffocated him and killed Bharat. And the cops took her to the prison. After a while, she had a bail. She came out. The shame was too much on her that she committed suicide. You see what the wolf does? What the, what the enemy does? He comes in to steal, kill, and destroy. Bharat's entire family was, was destroyed by this wolf. That's why Jesus said here, a hireling is someone who feels like it's not my job. I don't care about it. Who cares what happens to who? And he says, when the wolf comes, when the wolf comes, they will leave. You see, my friends, the Lord is saying to you, wolf is roaming everywhere. Satan is roaming everywhere. Every country, every nation, every people group wanting to destroy the lives of people. But God is saying to you, he is speaking to you today. There's someone in your family. There's someone in your community. Someone in India and Africa. They are waiting for you and me. We are the, the, the associates of the good shepherd so that we would go and snatch those people before the wolf gets them. And maybe there's somebody this week that you go need to go and look around. You need to look around your, uh, your neighborhood, your, your, your workplace, wherever. You need to say, okay, can I snatch this person out? And God will use you. You are his body. My friends, I want to wrap it up. But as I, as I finish my sermon, I want to say something to you. God is saying you, step out of the hireling mindset. Take ownership of the global mission that's happening in Africa and India. And how can you respond? Can I say something to you? Start sending people. You may say, hey, I cannot go that far. You know, it's okay. We understand that. But there's people waiting. I want you to see this slide of graduates sitting there waiting, saying, will somebody support us and send us to a community where we can go and give gospel to the people? As I pray, I want to say to you, understand that God wants you to be a kingdom steward. What is a steward? A steward is someone who gives an account of the time, treasure, and talent that you have received from the master. And that's Jesus. Worshippers, please come on stage. And let's prepare to sing that song, Make Room. You know, I met a Canadian aged couple. And they came and they said this. I listened to them saying this. We are retired. I was happy to hear that. Because I thought something is going to be given for the work of gospel. They said, we did not purchase a house. I was even more excited. Must be there's more saved up for the work of kingdom. But guess they said this. They said, we have retired. We did not need a house because we are putting all our money into cruising. Cruise ship. You know, it's okay to buy a house. It's okay to go on a cruise. But to take all your investment and to put all your investment on a cruise line for the rest of your life, uh, lying, lounging next to a pool that is on top of a pool called ocean. <laughs> Double the pool. And then as you lounge there, you look at the sun, forgetting that one day the son of God is going to look at you and he will ask you account of every time and treasure and talent he gave you and you need to give an account. And you know, this will all break down to one place. If you have encounter with this good shepherd, it's easy for you. It's easy for you to be a part of global mission. It's easy for you to take this message and share it with one another. It's easy for you to take your, take your finance and, and, and give for the work of gospel, for the training of leaders. And my friends, uh, we are so thankful for the Canadian church. You know why? 
Indian church is still growing from being in the receiving end to the giving and the sending end. You've been on the receiving side. You have taught us as Eastern, part of Eastern people, you have taught us what it means to be a missionary because we did not know what missionary life means. You taught us what does it mean to give to missions. But I want to say to you, don't stop. Don't ever stop that culture that, that was the very reason for God to bless you in this part of the world. You know why you are on the blessed, blessed part of the world and I am on the developing, struggling part of the world? That's because your fathers gave to the work of gospel. Your fathers, your fathers went to the place God called them. Your fathers stood. They took ownership and stewardship of this message of cross given to them and took that to the ends of the earth. And now I want to say to you, don't stop. Let's pray. Let's pray. Can you just have that simple chorus and then we'll come to prayer? Just for a moment. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I will make room for you. now as eyes are closed my friends my life changed in the altar my life changed when I went to the altar and I said God here I am I, I'm just nothing I, I have had ADHD I struggle with so many other things I, I just don't even know whether I can I can do this Bible but I heard him say I have a plan for you I have a purpose for you. And you are here in the room. You could be in the gallery. You could be watching us online. Or this message could be translated to you wherever you are listening, my friends. I know you have given your life to Jesus. But I want to ask you, will you, will you commit your life to be a steward of this message God gave you? God did not give this message to the politicians. God give, did not give the message of the cross to the, to the people out there, to the, to the secular world. God gave it to the church. And he's asking you, is there still, still a generation that will stand up and say, I will take this message to the ends of the earth. I will take this message to my neighbors. We cannot come this day, this far, and go back without taking, uh, without giving a response, without uh, saying yes to Jesus. Wherever you are in this place, can you say that with me? Say, I want to recommit my life along with you. I've been in ministry 15 plus years. I've been a pastor, but I'm yielding and saying, God, I am willing if you want to make changes. I am willing if you want to send me to an unreached people group. I am willing if you want to take me and use me once again to do something fresh somewhere. And there's people here in this house right now. Keep your eyes closed. But if your heart feels like that, if there's, a, if there's a pinch in your heart saying from the Holy Spirit, I want you to become a shepherd. I want you to stand with the kingdom vision. I want you to take the message. I want you to extend, lay your life for the work of the gospel to be expanded in many parts of the world. If you're hearing that, wherever you are, close your eyes. A call to come and serve him. A call to be his servant. Wherever you are. Just lift up your hands and show me. Keep your eyes closed. I see your hand. All over here. And even people in the back, I see. Wherever you are, you are saying, let me, let me clarify that once again to you. You are saying this morning in the church that I am giving my life to be a kingdom steward, to take the message, to serve in his kingdom and to transform the lives of people. If you are here, wherever if you put your hands up in the air, kindly stand wherever you are. Wherever you are, just stand. I want to pray for you. 
I want to pray for you. I want to pray for people giving their life. For the, come on, put your hands together, everyone. Everyone, just lift up Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the people that are brave. Thank you for the people that are saying, I'm tired of things out there. I, I, have, I have served people. I have served uh, uh, others. I have served systems and, and every, everything else. But now I want to give it for Jesus. My friends, I want to I wanna urge you, do something. This is a day that you will remember. As a day that you went forward and you made a decision by saying, I did make a decision to serve Him in whatever way is possible, wherever you are. As we sing this song, I will make room for you. Let this be your anthem. Let this be your song. And step out of that place and come here in a moment. We and other pastors are going to pray over you. Just step out of that place. Come forward, please, to the altar. Feel free, yes. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Friends, I would encourage... After this, we're going to just leave the premises. I would encourage even people in the gallery, if you're online, just put that in the comment section. Type in. And just enter into a time of worship. Thank you, Lord, for the people who are giving their life to Jesus, who are receiving Jesus as their good shepherd. We go into a posture of surrendering to Jesus. Just stretch out that hands and say, Jesus, we make this a prayer. For your life people who are in the altar just say to Jesus Jesus I give you my life I lay my life on the altar to serve you Jesus He's breaking right now Chains are falling People are being released People are being loosed
We make room for you to do whatever you want to do. I know in each life here, we got things going on. We got pressures. We got finances. We got all these different things coming at us. But, Lord, you are number one. We reclaim that space for you. You're number one. You're not number two. You're not number three. You're not in some package. You're not in some box. You are number one. You take that spot. We make room for you in our lives, in our businesses, in our workplaces, in our homes. We make room for you in our neighborhood, our nation, in our world. Lord, I thank you for the good word from this little ADHD kid who's going, what's my purpose? What's my plan? And you put our feet on solid ground. You make what you make right. You take a word that's been spoken over us and, and you take words that are, are not correct and not right and that bring death and you bring life. You are the life bringer. And today I pray over each and every person that's standing here that you would breathe life, life, words of life, that we have a mission. We have the Holy Spirit that goes before and with and through. God, we recommit our life to you. Maybe for the first time we commit fully our whole lives to you but Jesus I pray that this is like a missions convention we've come in the door we've been filled up and now we're going to walk out the door what are we going to do with the missions that we've heard with the life transformation that we've experienced today oh I get excited thinking about that and so Lord I thank you I am anticipating you to move in powerful ways in this community. Shake up the ground. Shake up the ground. Shake up the ground. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. you for the good work that you're doing. You're not even done yet. You're not even done yet. And so, Lord, we make room within our lives to spend time with you. Can we do that? We make room within our businesses to make you number one. We make room within our finances to say we will not back down. We will continue to give to missions, not only locally, but across the world. 
And Lord, we pray over Crystal and Sarah. Where are you, Sarah? Come on. Come on. We want to pray over them. Just a special blessing. Crystal's heading out the next couple days. He's going to be heading back to Chennai. And, and God, I, I know that God's doing a good work in his heart while he's here. But would you pray with me for strength? Would you pray for finances? Would you pray for doors to be miraculously open? Come on up here. Jesus, God, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by you this morning. You're so good. I'm overwhelmed by your goodness, by your grace on us. And I thank you for the good message, the good word that was deposited this morning. May it be good soil that it lands in. And so, Lord, I thank you for the blessing that the Indian church has on Canada today. The deposit. I thank you for Christo being a missionary to us because we need it. We need the good word deposited once again. And would it, would it blossom and would it bloom and bear fruit? God, I pray that you would open doors as they head back. I pray, Lord, for bigger venues because the one that they're in right now can't hold the goodness that's about to come. I pray, Lord, for more buildings, more communities to open up to the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that their five campuses would become 15. Lord, I pray for the hundreds to turn into thousands. Lord, the thousands to turn into 10,000. And that those would scatter across the globe, lifting up one name, the name of Jesus. We pray a blessing upon them as they travel. I pray for burdens to be lifted and people to come around them that would lift their arms in the name of Jesus. Everybody said, come on. Amen. We love you guys. Listen, what a morning. I know that God is continuing to do things in your heart if you want to linger. Please do that, but be blessed. Be blessed this week, and may you be a blessing to others. Amen.